Ah, okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at deepastronomy.space. And I'm always pleasantly surprised when I see, when I hit the broadcast button and all of the uh, all of the stream locations say that it's good. So it, apparently we are streaming live now. You guys are watching and listening to me, which is always great. So thank you very much. Today's Hangout is going to be one of our most exciting. We're going to be talking about the outer solar system, something that has always filled me with a lot of confusion in terms of, well, where, do, you know, most people think, well, maybe our solar system just ends with uh, the minor planet Pluto or Neptune. But no, not so much. It, there's more stuff faster. There's there's Kuiper Belt objects. There's uh, the Aurora Cloud. There's all these things out there that are part of our solar system that are gravitationally bound by our sun. And so maybe that's the edge. But then you think about things like, the heliopause. What the heck is that? And, you know, is that the edge of our solar system? And we've heard about that recently, not too well, sort of recently, with the passage of Voyager. The Voyager probe, I think, went past the heliopause. Anyway, my guests are going to settle all of this for us today. They have... Um, they uh, they have done some work on the outer the physics of the outer solar system, and they're going to help share us some of the things that they've got, some of the models that they have uh, to help us understand it. And uh, I want to let you know a couple things. Um, Carol and I are still working on this. Oh, by the way, Carol is here. She's with us. She's just on the phone. She's currently uh, driving uh, down to my neck of the woods. If, she, and if you're there, Carol, feel free to chime in. She has to push the mute button I, on her phone. I'm here. I'm there. actually leaving your neck of the woods. But I oh, you're going north. Stopped. I'm going north, but I'm oh. stuck. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Are you sitting there? Is I-95 a parking lot right now? Yes. Oh, my God. I hate when that happens. I know just what you're going through. It's like all these snowbirds. Are you a snowbird, Carol? I mean, I, I, is that what, are you classified as no, a snowbird? No, no, this is, this is road construction. Oh, good, okay. Sometimes on 95, it is a parking lot, and it's that way, yeah. all the way from Jacksonville, all the way up to uh, south of the border in, in, the, in the North Carolina, South of the Carolina uh, border. It's a mess. Yep. I've, I've had to yep. do that. Yep. I don't envy you. Well, good. That means you could participate in uh, while yeah. you're sitting there looking at the lovely cars in front of behind you. So anyway, she's on the phone and uh, is going to let us know, uh, you know give us her thoughts and, and, and comments uh, throughout the Hangout. Which, but, I, but my point in saying that was all, it, not that it's cool that Carol can be here even though she's on the road, uh, is that you know, Carol and I are going to be working on the format of this Hangout in 2018. We want more of you to watch. We especially want those of you who do watch it to interact with us more. And so I'm going to come coming up with ideas where hopefully you guys can uh, interact with us, join us. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of ways to uh, maybe have a question or something that we can all talk about by the end of the hangout that you guys can help answer. Um, and so if you have any ideas of ways in which you can be more involved, uh, besides just reading the comments and stuff that, that I usually do, then let us know. I want to get innovative. I want to push the envelope. I want to be inclusive with as many people as possible. And most, most importantly, Carol and I want to bring the, the research of these professional astronomers to you in a way that you not only understand, because we definitely want that, but we also want you to have fun and interact with the, you know with all of us and, and give professional astronomers feedback on what you're doing. So we're going to be playing with that a little bit. And there's a couple of ways. People always ask how they can support deep astronomy. And there's going to be ways in which, and these hangouts in particular, uh, because we, do, we are looking for ways in which we can help uh, financially expand what we are doing on these hangouts. And while you don't necessarily need to give money, uh, one way you can help support what we're doing is to share these Hangouts when they're online. Uh, let people know you're watching this and share it out to other people. Maybe give a link to the Deep Astronomy website. It's important because I'm trying to grow the Deep Astronomy traffic base, deepastronomy.space traffic as well. Share that out there. Let people know that Deep Astronomy is a resource that you're counting on. All of these things help 
to um, support what we're doing here without having to spend a dime. So um, we do have Patreon stuff we, and things like that that, that absolutely help us, and, and uh, we'll talk about that in, in future Hangouts. But I just want to let you know that there are plenty of ways people can support these Hangouts that don't involve spending any cash. So please spread the word uh, and help us, and help us uh, make, get these Hangouts to grow because everybody wants to see a wider audience, and we kind of like that too. So... Um, so that's going to happen. And before I start today's hangout, I also want to mention that I have an idea. The, the American Astronomical Society, Carol doesn't know I'm going to say this. The American Astronomical Society runs something called the Worldwide Telescope. And it's an awesome program. And I was looking at it the other day, and I was thinking of ways of adding Hubble images to the Worldwide Telescope. And it turns out there's ways to do that. Uh, using JPEG images and things that are already on Hubble site. So what I'm going to do is that tonight at about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock, I'm going to live stream a contest where we can take an image of, uh, say, the Horsehead Nebula and put the header information that Worldwide Telescope needs in it to, um, to, uh, to add some images. I'm thinking mostly of the Horsehead Nebula image that they just added recently. I'd like to add that to Worldwide Telescope. So I'm going to talk about this contest tonight at 9 o'clock. If you can't make it live, don't worry about it. It'll be posted. You can watch it later. But it's a way all of us, image processor geeks especially, can get involved in helping make the Worldwide Telescope better. And that's something that the AAS is also supporting the American Astronomical Society, and, um, and I, I had an idea that's one way that we can all get involved. So join me tonight, 9 o'clock. I'll talk about it. If you miss it, just watch the thing after the fact. I will outline everything you need to know to add images to Worldwide Telescope. Okay, so um, I am watching us on, I'm, well, I'm, I'm broadcasting on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and uh, Periscope, and I'm looking at the live chats on all of them, but I'm mostly... And there's a lot of people already on, on YouTube, but I'm also looking at my lovely Discord server, which I am falling in love with right here. There it is, a picture of my Discord server. And I'm, I've been having fun with it all day, uh, talking with people about image processing. So um, Peter Q is asking, is Carol underwater? No, she's on the phone, but the, 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 the audio quality is going to be just so-so. Okay, so let me get to our guest. Let me pull them up. My guests today are both from the University of Alabama, uh, uh, and um, the uh, the top panel is uh, Nikolai uh, Pogorilov. He's uh, and these guys are great. They have great job titles, by the way, guys. They're both space physicists at the University of Alabama. Now, that's pretty cool. I didn't. I, didn't, I, uh, um, I like that title. So it'd uh, be, be cool to learn what what they do and and how they they go about their jobs. Also, in the lower panel is Jacob. Um, Herrick Housen, uh, he's also at the University of Alabama, also a space physicist. Welcome, guys, to our Hangout. Hello. Hi. Okay, good. So you guys work on, or you guys think about, the outer solar system. Can you help us visualize what we mean when we say that? You're not just talking about Pluto or, or Neptune or Uranus, and those, that is, those are planets in the outer solar but you guys are looking a little bit further out, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, there is a, a common now to distinguish the inner heliosphere from the outer heliosphere. And the inner heliosphere is something closer to the sun, obviously. And uh, uh, Earth belongs to the inner heliosphere and a few planets afterwards. It is now also uh, common to say that the outer heliosphere is the part of the heliosphere which is somehow affected by the presence of the local interstellar medium that surrounds uh, the uh, heliosphere. Okay, let's, let's start by talking about a heliosphere. Um, that is a term that, re that, that means what? It's, it's w things that are inside the... Uh, this the is a part of space which is occupied by uh, solar plasma, let's say, by the solar wind produced by the sun oh i hadn't heard that okay so does it have anything to do also with the sun's magnetic field or is it just the plasma i guess because of the plasma oh yes of it, course. Would, it, would, it would also be affected wouldn't it field is uh frozen into plasma and propagate outwards to the uh, very boundary of the heliosphere which is called the heliopause what's called the heliopause 
the boundary of the heliosphere. Okay, and this is the part of the solar system that and is that that well is that the boundary first of all the part where the, the well, it looks like it's the boundary because it is formed by the interaction of the solar plasma with the interstellar plasma and if two uh, streams of plasma or just two uh, streams of gas collide it is customary uh, for them to generate a surface which separates one flow from another. And this is called mathematically a tangential discontinuity. But oh, right, yeah. Uh, uh, but for us, uh, for the heliosphere, it is called the heliopole. Very similar, we have ma uh, magnetopoles uh, around planets, for example, around Earth, which separates magnetic field of Earth from the solar wind plasma. This is called the magnetopause. And by analogy, they started calling the boundary of the heliosphere the heliopause. Okay. Now, you guys have created a model, and you've also given me a lot of uh, uh, diagrams here so I can show them. Please let me know which one you'd like me to put up. Can you describe to me your model of the outer regions of the solar system? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, do you want me to put up one of these? Yeah. Uh, this one where uh, with the captions... Uh, about uh, this one, uh, yeah, this one. Ah, okay. So uh, this is uh, actually a simulation result uh, where uh, it shows the heliopause as the boundary between something which is patchy inside. So the uh, heliosphere uh, is. Uh, this is actually a magnetic field shown here, but the heliopause separates the. Uh, so, uh, solar plasma from the interstellar plasma, uh, then uh, uh, the interstellar medium uh, flows from the right to the left here, and uh, it can form a so-called bow wave, which is a boundary which is shown here in this figure. And also uh, the heliosphere uh, extends, uh, according to our models, uh, very far uh, downwind, uh, and uh, for this reason, this part of the heliosphere is called the heliotail. Okay, now your X and Y or X and Z labels <laughs> just have numbers on them. I don't see units. So are yeah, we are we right. looking at here in space physics? It's customary to use astronomical units. Ah, that's AU. So we're units. looking. Wow. So this thing is spanning from uh, this is twenty five hundred yeah. AU. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, and the, and the, the the sun is actually in in the middle of the uh, of the front of it. There. This so really, yeah, I, I can't do my cursor on this, but yeah, in the middle of that, the, toward the right part where the bow shock bow wave is, it's in that real bright part, right, right. Next yeah, to there it. is a center actually, clearly something which is a point at the center above the circular structure. Was a this is where the sun is. It's uh, it's uh, at uh, in this figure. It's at a distance where X is equal to 2,200 astronomical units. Okay, so uh, uh, we so are... Go we show this uh, figure in the... Uh, this is, of course, three-dimensional, and we show just a cross-section. And cross-section is formed by the uh, uh, Z and X axes of our coordinate system. The Z axis is parallel to the sun's rotation axis. Ah, okay. It's good to clarify. And the x-axis belongs to the plane which is formed by the z-axis and the direction of the interstellar medium flow. So if you slice the sun in half from pole to pole, uh, you would get a cross-section that looks for, uh, across the spin axis like this. And yeah. this um, bow shock, bow wave, is created... We're standing back way away from the solar system right now. We are way out there. We're not going to see individual planets at this distance. We're not. So when you look down at this solar system or at our solar system from this, the bow wave is being created by the wind of stars in the galaxy, or is it the rotation of the well, galaxy? Well, essentially, uh, from the astro astronomy perspective, we have the uh, 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 galactic is uh, moving in certain direction with a certain speed. 
the galaxy's but rotating. On the other right. hand, the sun is also moving somewhere. And so... Uh, ah, within uh, the galaxy's spiral the arms. Velocity, oh, the, right. the relative velocity is uh, about uh, 25 kilometers per second. Relative to what? Uh, uh, between uh, the... Uh, Local cloud, uh, I guess, right? Interstellar medium and uh, uh, the solar system. Okay, so the galaxy is rotating at some rate. That's that's happening, and then the sun is moving within the galaxy. So that's also happening. Do the and you add those two motions yep. up, and you get this picture. Yeah, and we have this picture. The uh, rel- the uh, vector of relative velocity belongs to the plane of this figure. And, and what then, are the colors? And then also the sun, the sun is putting out stuff. So there's a lot of that velocity too, right? So the solar wind. Oh, yeah, that's right. We are talking about the relative velocity yeah. because right. our so coordinate system. Yeah, we use a heliocentric uh, coordinate system where, uh, well, sort of, it's shifted. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the sun is uh, at rest uh, in this coordinate system. So, so from the point of view of the simulation, the, the, the sun is sitting there fixed. It's emitting uh, solar wind that's creating these this sort of patchiness, these oranges and reds. Um, and at the same time, in, uh, from the right-hand side of the box, there's a continuous flow of interstellar material. And so that's also really why the heliopause is, is the boundary of the solar system, because outside of that, everything you... you can measure or you can touch out there came from some other distant place in the galaxy. It didn't come from the sun or, or the solar system. Okay. And real quick, what do the colors mean? Uh, the colors mean uh, the uh, magnitude and the magnitude is, uh, is in micro Gauss. So this is from the, uh, let's say earth perspective, pretty small magnetic field because the distances are very far. And uh, uh, you see that uh, inside the heliosphere, uh, there are patches uh, of different polarity of magnetic field. Magnetic field changes direction uh, uh, every 11 years at the solar maximum of the magnetic uh, uh, axis of the sun switches to the opposite hemisphere. And for this reason, uh, we uh, see this patchiness uh, in the distribution of the, uh, essentially what is shown, it's out of plane component of the magnetic field. Okay, thank you. So, so the colors are coming towards us, the field lines are coming towards us out of the page, and then the other colors are, the, the magnetic field is moving away. Yeah, from the green one just goes inside, yeah. Okay, just a quick comment. Uh, Delbert Freeman, I turned my I turned their mic gain down a bit. Please let me know how that gives. And I also dropped my mic a little bit. I'm still experimenting with the uh, audio. These guys <laughs> are really, really, really good at telling me when things don't sound well. So um, so let me know how that is. I just turned them down uh, a little bit. Hopefully it's not uh, as loud as it was. Okay, so um, so I, I know from my experience, now I don't, uh, I, I don't have a lot of uh, um, experience with uh, the sun's magnetic field, except to say that when I worked at the High Altitude Observatory, we had built an instrument designed to try and measure the magnetic fields using polarized light from the sun. And I got to tell you, that was a hard measurement to make. When you show me a graph that has magnetic field strength in it, what are, are those... Are those modeled, or are they actually measured? And if they're measured, then how did you do it? Well, what is shown here is, uh, uh, let's say, a simplified a nominal model of the heliosphere where we simply introduce uh, the uh, boundary between fast and slow solar wind and uh, uh, accordingly use the Parker solution as the boundary uh, conditions for simulations, but uh, once uh, this model is created, even this nominal model of the heliosphere turns out that it can reproduce uh, the average distributions of magnetic field, which is measured by spacecraft far away 
uh, from the sun. And uh, in addition, of course, there exist models which are uh, completely data driven. This one is, uh, of course, also data driven, but in a simplified fashion. But data driven, that's on the ba means on the basis of uh, magnetograms uh, you were talking about uh, in, uh, in Boulder, in, uh, well, in National. Uh, solar observatory, right. solar observatory, solar dynamics observatory. There are many observatories which measure photospheric magnetic field. And these photospheric magnetic field can be used directly in modeling the solar wind, and it is used. That's but great. this is just a, a little bit higher level model. And uh, in many aspects, uh, using this model at uh, so large distances from the sun at the boundary of the uh, heliosphere may be excessive for some purposes, at least when we want to understand uh, some features of the interstellar medium, which are uh, not can be uh, analyzed not only on the basis of theory and simulation, but also by direct measurements of Voyager 1 that penetrated the two twin spacecraft. One of them is still in the heliosphere, another one is. Uh, or like 20 astronomical units deep in the interstellar medium and measuring in situ this magnetic field and uh, plasma activity, particle activity beyond that. And the models uh, nowadays indeed can reproduce that. And what's important to mention is this connection that <coughs> it appears, uh, and this is where uh, Jacob's simulations uh, participate uh, a lot uh, in the analysis of connection between the interstellar media and solar wind. We, we mentioned that the heliopause is the boundary which doesn't allow solar plasma to penetrate outside in the interstellar medium and vice versa. But neutral particles, neutral atoms, and the interstellar medium uh, has uh, more, three times more neutrals than ions. These neutral atoms, they easily penetrate inside the heliosphere where they experience charge exchange with ions, produce uh, uh, new neutral atoms with the properties of parent uh, ions. And they also produce ions with the properties of parent neutrals. And neutral particles were created in the heliosphere can penetrate back into the interstellar medium and affect it. And as well, of course, the, during this charge exchange, solar wind is affected by, uh, by neutrals. So in this way, we connect actually the astrophysical distances, astrophysical uh, object like interstellar medium with uh, solar physics. Uh, which is, just, I think, just one of the most exciting fields of science. Yeah, that that's that. I I couldn't agree more. Okay, let me. I see a couple of comments. Uh, you guys are asking about Carol. Carol is on the phone. Uh, Galaxia, you joined late, and um, and so yeah, Carol's on the phone. She's driving uh, north from Florida. And are you there, Carol? I am here. Okay, I think this is a great I'm opportunity here, yeah. for you to talk a little bit about these hangouts and what we're doing and uh, what, what our purposes of the hangouts are. Sure. Some of, some of you already know that afternoon astronomy, coffee, hangouts were kind of the brainchild of, of us scientists sitting around. You know, we have coffee in our institutions and we talk about various research that interests us. And so we thought, wow, it'd be really great if we could have those coffees with the people who are actually doing the research, but also invite people in from the outside, and we can do that on the internet. So we started these a number of years ago. Some of them used to be concentrated only on Hubble, but now we're trying to look at lots of things that a lot of um, space physicists as well as astrophysicists are looking at. And we want to understand what they're doing and chat with them in an informal way. Um, and this idea caught on and the American Astronomical Society has graciously uh, supported us for a year and they are continuing this year. 
And the American Astronomical Society is the Society of Professional Astronomers, Astrophysicists, Space Physicists, and anybody um, who's more or less professionally, but also amateur astronomers who are interested in astronomy. And we have yearly meetings, but we also have something interesting that young astronomers are putting together where they read scientific papers and then they put a synopsis on a website. And I, I think this is one of the few disciplines where we do this. And this is actually how I found this paper because heliophysics is not my discipline, but I read this blurb and it's on a website called AAS Nova. And so I look through there and, I, and there are lots of good synopsis of papers of the research going on. So I invite you to look at that and that's how I found this paper. So um, that's what the American Astronomical Society is all about, and we thank you for their support. Yes, absolutely. And uh, and as Carol said, this is something uh, that professional astronomers do all the time, and we are looking for ways to uh, increase our interactivity with you. That's my big goal this year. So um, I, I know that we, we cover a lot of information. We want to let these astronomers tell you about the research, but we also want you to get something out of it as well. So um, Achilles 308, for example, is asking, could a large rocket accelerate a small payload to these distances to study the heliosphere within a reasonable time period? Um, are there any massive high-speed missions planned? Guys, can we get there quickly, or are we looking at Voyager timescales? Uh, well, there is uh, an approved uh, uh, IMAP mission uh, uh, which will uh, combine some certain features of uh, Voyagers and uh, Ibex Interstellar Boundary Explorer. It's a future mission, but it's in the stage of preparation and design, but it's already approved by NASA. It will also uh, uh, investigate the properties of the outer heliosphere, at least uh, in the uh, near future. Yeah, uh, But uh, it takes time. Uh, to get uh, <laughs> to the boundary of the interstellar medium, as you know, it's like, uh, is it 40 years now of the, or 45 years of Voyager mission? So it's an old mission, and uh, and uh, most of uh, instruments work well, produce results. Believe it or not, uh, they can even reboot on board computer on uh, spacecraft, which is so many, so uh, miles away from us. Did you want to add anything to that, uh, Jacob, or no? Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say, uh, so, so IMAP is, is something we're excited about that's coming soon, but, but IMAP is, is going to image these regions from, from much closer to home. So it, it's going to... Uh, Can you say it again? Go... What was the mission to call? I'm sorry to interrupt, but what was oh, it? Uh, IMAP. IMAX. So, oh yes. Okay, we've got some stuff to to show from there. Well, so so there's IBEX, which is oh. the mission launched in 2009. This will be a, a follow up mission, kind of follow up mission um, called IMAP. Okay. So, uh, and yeah. And but they have a similar philosophy in that rather than going out to those very distant regions and and measuring things in situ, which of course is extremely valuable basically priceless those measurements but you know you're still only at one point when you're out there and and you know you, there's no way that you can kind of fly around the heliosphere and kind of measure everything you're always just on on an escape trajectory and and you can only measure what's along that path when you're there so um so we we there's been a recent sort of switch to these more sort of imaging kind of ideas and this is using the neutral atoms that that um uh, Nick was mentioning, um, where where these neutral particles are created in this boundary region of the heliosphere, near the heliopause, and they have the properties of that region, but they can travel long distances without any interaction because they're neutral, and in fact, we can measure them near Earth. So, so okay, the, let me. Okay, you, this is twice you brought it up, and I think it's gone over my head both times. the The neutral atoms are important to you guys in the outer solar system because they, first of all, are neutral. They don't interact with the sun's magnetic field, and they build up uh, near the heliopause. 
Uh, there is a bit of a build up, but the, the more interesting thing is is when they do have an interaction. So they don't interact with the magnetic field, but right. if a neutral particle like hydrogen atom, let's say, passes nearby a, a proton from the plasma, you know, they, they kind of pass close by the right. electron from the hydrogen atom could jump to the proton. So now the what was a proton and has the sort of energy of the plasma is suddenly neutral. And it can shoot off and can be measured. And so then we can say, ah, so the plasma had some of these types of properties that this neutral particle. So you uh, can understand the plasma in the outer solar system better by looking at these neutral atoms as they interact with the charged particles out there uh, and get a sense of just of what, how uh, the density, what the behavior is out at the, at the heliopause, um, that sort of thing. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, you, you, we, we can, we can, you know, you you really also need the model. So that's that's you know, the the model Nick showed is, is sort of, you know, it, we have to have some kind of baseline to work with, right? Okay. So we, we we basically we turn our detector in a particular direction in the sky. We see a certain number of neutral particles hitting it, you know, a certain flux of neutrals at a certain energy, um, and that tells us that oh, in that direction of the heliosphere we're getting a certain source of these energetic neutral atoms. Okay. I want to show this animation you gave me, but is it a good time? Is this an appropriate time or not? And, uh, I think maybe at this point, uh, uh, maybe it's a little bit early, but okay. uh, uh, you can show <laughs> just once this figure, which is also the heliosphere, but even at a, a larger perspective. Okay, okay. I'm just showing stuff it's right like, now. Uh, is it this uh, one? I, uh, I like to say, no, this uh, is very long. Ah, uh, this one. Kiliota. Uh, yeah, this uh, one. Okay. All right. So uh, this is uh, uh, what I like to say is the image of the heliosphere uh, from the interstellar uh, alien perspective. So This is what an alien or, would see coming at our solar system. Aliens who live uh, yeah. far away from us, they may look at... Uh, uh, our solar system and see something like that, maybe. And if they had magnetic field eyes, they could see that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you see now the, the, the range here of this figure from the left to the right is 12,000 uh, astronomical units. Say that again. How many? How many thousand? Oh, there goes 12,000. 12,000 AU. So we got quite a, quite a range here. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. And so your model, this is output from your model, correct? Uh, yeah, that's oh, right. Okay, good. And the um, and what it, these these Ibex images here, what did – you want to talk about those a little bit too while we're here? Yeah, uh, I think. Right yeah, time okay. Time. So, 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 um, so this is a, a – you can see the Ibex spacecraft uh, in, in the center of that picture there. And it, it, it has two – single pixel cameras and you can kind of see them a little bit on the uh, on, on the sides there that are sort of pointing diagonally outward and um, Ibex spins in such a way that the, uh, the solar panels that you can see there are facing the sun and it's spinning so that the cameras are, are always uh, sort of sweeping the sky but in such a way that the sun is never in their field of view because then you get all sorts of other things hitting your detector. Um, and uh, because they, they spin around, uh, sorry, IBEX spins around and basically goes around the sun with the earth, it actually maps out the entire sky in six months. So every six months, IBEX has seen every single direction in the sky and can create these maps of the sky. So that's what, that's what the two oval things are. And um, because it has two cameras, uh, one is called Ibex High and the other is called Ibex Low. Uh, Ibex High focuses on the higher energies, Ibex Low obviously on the lower energies. Um, and I guess the, the most interesting thing in this picture is this band that you can see there, this sort of band, which is, means that from those directions, we're seeing significantly more energetic neutral atoms than from the other directions in the sky. That, so in the in the top panel, you're seeing more energetic neutral atoms than in the lower one. Uh, not exactly. So, so the upper panel, 
you can see the blue regions are, are, are regions where there is low counts right. and the green and the yellow and especially the red and the orange are high counts. And so you can see that this band that sort of stretches across the picture that's um, where we're seeing a lot more than, than in the other areas of the sky. Okay. And this was a, a, a mysterious, actually, first measurement of uh, Ibex. It really took uh, some time to uh, find out the mechanism uh, that describes uh, this feature. And uh, so you weren't Jacob expecting is to see this. co-author on uh, uh, one mechanism, which is now, I think, is uh, uh, more or less accepted by the community as the working one which attributes this to uh, phenomena which occur actually in the interstellar medium. So what we see, what Ibex sees here, this increased uh, flux of uh, energetic neutral atoms, they originate in the interstellar medium. It just, uh, just to think about it just makes you wonder about the mysteries of... Uh, uh, you know, of nature. So hang on. So instead of seeing these energetic particles being generated within the helio, the heliosphere, like you're saying, these are what's being observed here in this image are energetic particles, the flux from energetic particles created in the interstellar medium outside of our solar well, system. So, so of course, we, we, we never know for sure, right? That's the thing when you image like this. All we can really say is when we look in this direction, we see more than when we look in this other direction. And and the only real way to sort of try to sort of get some uh, handle on this is, is to use the simulations, right? That's sort of the best guess of what the heliosphere looks like that we have, the, the pictures that, you know, from, from Nick's simulations that we were looking at. And, of course, nowhere in those simulations would you expect a, a sort of a narrow band of flux from across the sky. You might expect maybe to see some asymmetry in the map related to the nose of the heliosphere, you know, the front and then the tail, you might expect those kind of things. But this is very different. And so what we what we realized, or in fact, one of our colleagues on the IBEX mission realized is that this band uh, actually seems to correlate with some properties of the magnetic field that is outside the heliopause. So the, the, the galaxy, of course, has a magnetic field that's kind of arranged in some direction. Of course, yeah, okay. The sun is kind of moving through that, and so this magnetic field drapes over the heliosphere. Well, that leads me to a question that might be related to this. So what about the heliospheres of other stars? Could this be a nearby heliosphere colliding with ours? No, no, no. The, these scales are still too small. Remember that we're, we're talking maybe a few thousand astronomical units. You know, we, we're nowhere near... Uh, light years, yes. Okay, all right. So that answers the question. Well, can we observe the heliospheres of other stars? That's from uh, Dark Time uh, on on the Discord chat. Uh, well, yes, of course. Uh, the uh, bow waves, bow shocks, uh, the astrotails, astrospheres are occasionally observed. There are many different types, and uh, some of them look similar. Uh, to the uh, possibly again, we don't, we cannot see uh, the heliosphere from outside, but uh, at least uh, uh, some astrospheres resemble the simulated heliosphere, but others are completely different. Some of them are extraordinarily unstable, others are very wide and with a very short astro tail, so probably uh, very much dominated by the stellar magnetic field and uh, the, of course uh, uh, astrospheres are observed on a regular basis by astronomers okay so well, when we see some of these bow shocks around the young stars so is it a similar phenomenon except some of these they're running into more dense material is it a similar phenomenon well, essentially, yeah, it's a deceleration of the uh, stellar wind uh, by the astrosphere, essentially. So the astrosphere, uh, it's uh, uh, the region of uh, uh, space which is occupied by the st some stellar wind, some particular, of a particular star, 
it moves through the interstellar medium. And uh, uh, as a result, uh, the interstellar medium has velocity with respect to the uh, astrosphere. And if velocity uh, is high, uh, greater than the speed of sound, there will be a bow shock formed in front of it. As, uh, as we talk, uh, uh, start talking about the uh, heliosphere, uh, we know a lot about this presence of neutral particles. And one of the uh, topics of the papers we are uh, discussing uh, is uh, the effect of charge exchange on uh, modification, actually, of uh, uh, bow shock. Uh, uh, the shock conditions, of course, cannot be uh, modified by the uh, presence of charge exchange. But uh, uh, if you have a shock and uh, neutrals start crossing uh, it, they affect quantities both in front and behind the shock. As a result, the shock is also modified. And in the case of the heliosphere, it modified in, this, in such sense that it becomes weaker. And in reality, even if the velocity, the relative velocity of the interstellar medium with respect to the sun is uh, supersonic, still uh, due to charge exchange, the bow, uh, bow shock itself, the pre a shock itself can disappear and instead will have a gradual increase uh, in the uh, magnetic field plasma properties towards the surface of the uh, heliopause. And another interesting feature, which we analyzed in detail in, the, in, the, in this paper, it was a quantitative analysis of uh, uh, plasma density distribution in front of the heliopause, on the interstellar side of the heliopause, where we discovered that there is well, we, uh, in reality, of course, we knew even before that the density of plasma in front of the heliopause becomes smaller. But now with uh, using simulations and adaptive mesh refinement, we were able to actually resolve in detail how density behaves and compare our simulation results with observations from the uh, plasma wave instrument on board of Voyager 2, and we, which is shown on, in the figure, uh, uh, this combined figure of simulation and uh, modeling. Which, which one did you want me to put up? That's the very wide figure, right? It's very wide. This yeah. one, or, or is it this one? Yes, this one. Okay. So, Oops. Uh, right here in this figure, uh, you see on the right-hand side, uh, uh, measurements of plasma waves, uh, essentially uh, uh, frequency of uh, waves uh, measured by plasma wave instrument on Voyager 1. And uh, uh, since plasma wave frequency depends only on the density, so we can derive uh, density out of that. And this was done meticulously by uh, Don Gornet, uh, and uh, who is PI on the plasma wave instrument. And he found uh, out that indeed, if you look at the figure, the further uh, Voyager 1 propagates into the interstellar medium, the plasma wave, the frequency of plasma waves is actually increasing. So in contrast to standard, uh, like re-entry, you can, uh, by the way, have analogy uh, of the heliopause interaction, heliosphere interaction with the interstellar media with a re-entry problem. So a spacecraft penetrates into the atmosphere and the shock is formed in front. But the maximum of density is always in the stagnation point on the surface of the body. In reality, in due to the presence of charge exchange, uh, the maximum of density is not on the surface of the heliopause but it's far away from it. And density continues incre to increase uh, while Voyager 1 moves outside. Right, and so... The, the figure on the left shows our simulation, which shows that indeed it's, it's indeed so, and there is uh, 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 
a, a reasonable agreement between uh, our simulations and observations performed by Voyager 1. And it's also interesting here that uh, if you look closer, this figure, at least on the right-hand side, that there were two events where density was not actually very different one from another. And the distance of about uh, like more than half a year between them. And similarly, on the, in the simulation, it appears that although there is a general trend of increase of the density inside in the interstellar media, there are certain periods of time where density stops increasing. But this is a time-dependent effect related to the solar cycle. And this is, uh, uh, we believe that uh, our simulations, even in this uh, more sophisticated uh, aspect are uh, in agreement with observation. Okay, you got okay. So let's back up here. We got a lot to show in this. I want to make sure well, that everybody. Wow, under, that's like, amazing. This is truly great. <laughs> so, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so let me. I'm visualizing this. So, so, and you would think you would think there would be this thing. It's going through. Uh, it's going through space. And so, what you're saying is that the density outside to so it is more. Rarefied, I, I know rarefied is a, a silly term, but rarefied inside the heliosphere, at, just outside, the density is actually higher. Well, if you look at this figure, can we uh, just show it uh, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in full screen, uh, the figure? Okay, do you mean like this? Uh, no, no, I mean, just, uh, well, we need to see the whole figure. Well, that's what I was showing you. Oh, you, oh you, uh, yeah. it may be okay. cropped for you. Uh, so hang on, let me go back. So this, it is it is being shown, uh, but it may be cropped for you in the Zoom window. Um, yes, that's right, that's okay. right. So you can see here that uh, on the left plot, that there is a, a, a first increase at about, uh, 80 astronomical units from the sun, there is the first increase in the uh, figure actually disappeared from my screen. Well, okay, no, but, but, but trust that it's shown, and, and if you can maybe okay. have it up so, on your... So, uh, this is the termina heliospheric termination shock. That at about 120 astronomical units, we have a, a jump-like increase in density. This is the boundary between heliosphere and interstellar medium. The density on the interstellar medium side is much higher than the density on the uh, heliospheric side of the heliopause. But the point, the, our point is that uh, further on, the density continues to increase. And is that so, shown in the dotted line on the right part there? Uh, that dotted... Uh, oh, uh, 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 these uh, red... Uh, uh, <coughs> Patches over there show uh, these plasma events. Yeah, but that's the, your model. I, so what I'm no, these are simulations on the right hand side. This blue figure, these are Voyager observations. Thank you. They that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's extraordinary so, observations which allowed us to actually uh, measure the density of plasma in the interstellar medium. Because unfortunately, on Voyager one, the plasma instrument is not operational. And that's why plasma density should be derived from frequencies of plasma waves. And plasma events, pl uh, with these wave events, uh, they are not so frequent. But you can see here, one, two, three, four, five, six events here. There are more probably now. I think there was an event started in August last year. Uh, it's, uh, but uh, uh, these events, also, we plot them uh, on the... Uh, uh, as points, these uh, 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 solid uh, point, uh, circles here on the uh, leftmost uh, figure, we show the simulation result. Okay. And, and we so show that uh, why uh, these, and even the dates of events are also indicated over there. And the agreement between observations and uh, uh, modeling is. Uh, uh, quite good, especially taking into account that this was not exactly a data-driven model. It was still a uh, 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 somewhat simplified model of the uh, solar cycle 
used there. Uh, uh, but still, it looks like it's, it's pretty uh, close. That's we right. are moving in the right so, direction, and the model indeed reproduces pretty sophisticated features. So the the real the so, real so uh, what. Go ahead, Sorry, go. I had another question. So, in the Voyager, and there's always this stuff in the media about is Voyager outside or inside the solar system? So, does this change then, where sometimes Voyager could be outside and sometimes Voyager could be inside because uh, of the solar cycle, and so the heliosphere is changing? Uh, maybe, Jake, just... you can answer to this question. <laughs> um, so, 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 yeah, I'll step back a little bit first and say th this is really how a lot of the our understanding of the heliosphere, where, how, how we get that. So it's always a combination of some measurements, and we don't have a lot, and some simulations, which we never quite know if it's capturing all the physics. So what we, what we like to see is exactly what we were looking at in that figure, where we can see that, that the simulation captures aspects of the data, of the limited data that we do have. So, so that lends us to think that what the simulation is showing is, is reasonably, is a reasonable approximation. So, you know, in the direction where we have data, it's, it works reasonably well, like, like we were just discussing. So probably in the directions where we don't have data, it's also a reasonable approximation. So, so this is how we kind of learn about, about the heliosphere. And then the question is Voyager inside or outside? Well, based on, on what we have done, uh, we would say, yes, it's definitely outside. It's basically, its measurements are consistent with everything we expect, um, you know, from, from our sort of model of the heliosphere, which, which puts the Voyager clearly outside uh, the heliopause. There are other models uh, that are out there, and maybe this is some of what you've come across um, you know, because it isn't an, you know, it isn't. We don't have as much data, for example, as the as the you know atmospheric science people who just have you know so much data that it's irrefutable. Here we just have limited data. We have some models. When things seem to work, then we say, okay, well, that's that's probably how it is. But people could argue that that point, and and some people do. Okay, well, I got to remind everybody that you are watching. I tried to do this 10 minutes ago. The Astro Coffee Hangout here on Deep Astronomy. We are talking about the physics of the outer solar system. And my guests today are Nikolai uh, Pogorilov uh, and Jacob um, Herrickhausen from the University of Alabama. We're talking, uh, we're trying to get the, uh, the, they have a model that has accurately described a lot of very in interesting things that weren't known about the area outside of the heliopause. The heliopause is that area where the solar magnetic field has a gap and, and, bef and before it starts interacting with the interstellar medium. One of those surprises was that there were increases in density of neutral particles as Voyage, the Voyager 1 probe did in fact exit the heliosphere, uh, Peter Q. They just uh, clarified that for you in the... Oh, plasma density. I'm sorry, plasma density increases over uh, outside of the heliopause uh, and more is stronger or is higher in the uh, interstellar medium side of the heliosphere. And uh, we had some questions a while back that I want when we were showing the um, IBEX data and I just want some clarification. The IBEX is measuring what wavelength or particle uh, again? Is it, it was, it's flux from neutral particles, right? That's right. So it's, it's, Effectively, these are neutral hydrogen atoms colliding with the detector. So it's not, not wavelengths or anything. This is actual particle counts. Okay, so something, a neutral atom hitting a detector, and it yeah. registers as a count. So that's what it's measuring. And so these, there's not a wavelength per se. These are actual particles. So, that's right. Yep. Right. Uh, and um, so we're, so some of this stuff I get that you were – very surprised about. Um, oh, wait, I have to get to Adam's question. Adam was asking, um, oh, shoot, Adam. Oh, here it is. Can neutral atoms uh, be used to estimate the interstellar magnetic field? Can so, so the, you know, the default answer should be no. However, when we link what we see in the IBEX data to what we can reproduce in the simulations, then what we see is that there is a correlation between this, this sort of 
enhanced band of uh, neutral atom flux uh, that we get in the simulation, there's a correlation between that and the interstellar magnetic field that we put into the simulation. So we can, we can play with the interstellar magnetic field and sort of best reproduce the IBEX data. And then we can say, well, you know, within the realms of our modeling, this is probably the most likely interstellar magnetic field. So you're, are you saying, it, 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 tell me if I'm way off base on this analogy, but it's very similar to inferring something that you can see, in this example, the neutral atoms, with something you can't see, the magnetic field, right? You can kind of infer. Yeah, it'd be because, and, and you have to really use the modeling to, to, to bridge that gap, you know, so, so, so it, isn't, it isn't arbitrary. There's a, there's a lot of complicated calculations that go on in between, um, but, in, but we, don't, we don't sort of, uh, we don't kind of put the answer into the simulation. We basically say, okay, let's take a magnetic field, run the simulation, produce the neutral atom flux. How does it compare with IBEX? And then we run it again and, and we see which, which magnetic field gives us the best answer. So we can't really reverse engineer it. It always has to go in the forward direction. Okay. Um, well, here's a good question from uh, a Lunar Black Star. I, I actually want to hear what you say about this. In what ways does the heliosphere change during the red giant phase of our star? During, for example, <laughs> or even during uh, other life cycles like a supernova. What, uh, <laughs> I, the supernova, I think we know what happens to the magnetic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, the that's the problem, man. Yeah. But, uh, but what would happen when, when the sun enters its red giant phase? Is it going to, are magnetic fields within red giant stronger or is it just going to decrease? Any idea? I, I, I know. I don't know enough about this. Do you know any ideas, Nick? Um, well, not, uh, uh, re not really. Uh, well, and it's really hard to say. Yeah, it's astronomers. But, but, it, but it's certainly true that that as the sun's output of particularly of solar wind changes, that will certainly change the the shape and the size of the heliosphere. So maybe that's gets at the answer. So, you know, if, if the sun starts producing 10 times as much solar wind, then yeah, we're going to get a very different heliosphere. It's going to be much larger. So but by the same token, if, if the sun starts to travel through a different uh, region of interstellar space, you know, a different interstellar cloud, then in the pressures on the outside of the heliopause will change. And that will also strongly affect the shape of the heliosphere. Uh, but magnetic field, uh, uh, a, a solar magnetic field is created by processes inside the sun. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, just what happens to those uh, uh, when uh, the sun uh, moves in the direction of becoming a red giant? Uh, frankly, it's uh, indeed out of my expertise, I cannot say. So, so I can imagine this would be a big deal to you if our solar neighborhood, the solar system, was traveling along in its little motions across the galaxy, and we hit something else, some other interstellar medium magnetic anomaly or feature, not necessarily an anomaly. That's going to be a big deal to you guys, isn't it? I mean, you guys are going to be like, whoa, hey, the shape of our heliosphere just changed. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, well, actually, it's expected because uh, uh, from astronomical perspective, our local interstellar cloud is uh, very close to the next cloud. But again, uh, is it 1,000 years or 10,000 years? Or five. Maybe it's only 100 years. So it's it's very difficult to say. I know the timescales here are, are really yeah. long, aren't they? But, yeah. but that, is, that is a question people look at, and in fact, some people are doing simulations to uh, to to look at those those things. Okay, all right. Well, let's see. Um, Achilles three hundred eight is asking: Do these neutral particles crossing our bow shock offer a hint at dark matter? locations throughout the galaxy you see what he did there he used my inference of, of seeing things we can see affected by things we can't see that's what he did there so what about it uh can we learn anything about dark matter in our local neighborhood by watching all this happen neutral particles are affected by gravity can you guys uh 
See what dark yeah. matter is doing to it? So, so basically in the model, so put it this way, there is no dark matter in our simulation. So we, so we can't really say anything about it. Ah, okay. Be, that would be the easy answer. I wonder if anybody's even mapped dark matter on the scale of a solar system, but I don't think they have. Yeah, that's right. That's we, right. We've seen it on galaxies. We've seen gal you know, galaxy black black matter maps. But um, okay, um, yeah, let's see. So um, Achilles three hundred eight is commenting. I say we send out high speed probes. Where did it go? I say we send out high speed probes in all directions and at or tiny probes in all directions and at high speeds. So get them out there like Breakthrough Starshot was going to do. Send out little tiny probes all over the uh, heliosphere, all of the, with the only job is to measure these neutral densities. What do you say? Would that, would that give you a lot of information? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it would be fantastic, actually. <laughs> but it never happen. Okay, well, no, it gets difficult too because, of course, these are very large distances. So you, you can't just have sort of a cube set kind of, uh, you know, a little box going this far out because it needs to have a substantial power source to send signals back. Oh, right. You need some kind of RTG or something to keep it going. Don't yeah, you? that's what Void yeah, That's right. That's right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Um, so you mentioned briefly in the past that you're looking at IMEX, I M E X, or IMAX. What is that right? I M A P. A oh, I map. I got it all wrong. Okay. Um, <laughs> is that the next step for you guys? Is that the next stage of your research? Is to hopefully get stuff from this satellite? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, we, you know, we're focused mostly on the models, and 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 as we sort of shown a little bit, our models are, uh, in some sense. Uh, this feedback between the data that that is there, the limited data, and that helps us to improve our models. Okay. And so, you know, I bet IMAP will produce more data at, at sort of higher fidelity than, than what we currently have. So it will help. It's a little, basically, it will force us to, to, you know, improve our models, basically. Okay. All right. Good. Well, and and as I guess you guys are pretty happy already with the uh, uh, correlation that you're seeing already with observed data from from from. Well, from yeah. Person. Well, we cannot say so. Yeah, we are pretty happy, but uh, still, there's a lot of room for improvement. You're not going to say no to more observations. And, uh, are and you? one should also mention in this connection, New Horizons mission, which uh, is uh, heliospheric. Oh right, that's right. So it, uh, it is now. It's it past is now. Pluto, <laughs> and it's uh, measuring quantities, uh, measuring peak appliance, measuring plasma, and uh, we also try to reproduce these observations. But these are more local simulations. Uh, but this is still out of heliosphere already. So the flow. Uh, uh, I, I, Already beyond uh, five, I would say, astronomical units is uh, interstellar wind is affected by charge exchange with interstellar neutral atoms. So, so uh, New these, Horizons is already being yeah. affected by this. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. And I also should be uh, just, uh, I think, emphasized in this connection that uh, we are at the stage now that where the amount of observational data is quite substantial. So it becomes increasingly difficult to uh, reproduce all of those. And so, and by the way, for this reason, models are improving uh, from year to year. All right. Well, that is good to emphasize. And on that note, I'm going to have to cut it off because we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank you guys for joining us. This has been a great uh, discussion of your research, the latest research of the uh, modeling that they've done of the outer regions of our solar system. I guess today were Nikolai Pogor Pogorlov and uh, Jacob uh, Henrikhausen. And um, I want to thank you both for taking time out, both from the University of Alabama. Both of them are space yeah, physicists. Thank you. Yeah, thanks thank for, you very thanks for thank joining. Thank you, Tony. Us. Yeah, you. and uh, we hope you come back when you get some, some, I don't know, if your models get better, if you get something that, that you want to talk more about, uh, uh, about the outer solar system that we need to hear, we would love to have you back. I oh, hope, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Carol, well, good, be safe driving home. I hope, uh, hope traffic yep. gets better for you. And yeah, you guys... Yeah. 
tune in eight o'clock or I'm sorry, nine o'clock tonight. I'll be back talking to you about this special challenge that I want to do uh, for worldwide telescope data. Hopefully you guys will, will tune in. And I realize for Europe, it's going to be too late, but maybe the, my U S counterparts, you guys can stay up and watch it. Thank you all very much on behalf of Carol Christian. I want to thank you all so much for watching. And as always keep looking up. Keep looking.